Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us for the workshop today. Uh, we'll be talking about Yara and Strelka. Um, these are tools that uh, both Paul and I um, use to identify and detect malware. Um, this is uh, our first time hosting this workshop, so uh, bear with us as maybe we, we work out some of the kinks with the infrastructure. We will have an actual live lab environment with which you can run uh, Yara and Strelka and uh, see the output of these tools and uh, hopefully create some rules and learn something new along the way. Um, quick uh, just kind of note, we do expect you to have some level of familiarity with uh, the Linux command line uh, or just command lines in general. Um, as much as possible, we'll try to guide you through uh, the steps for some of the exercises, um, but know that you may find yourself Googling uh, some background on some of these tools if you're not familiar with them or you've never used them before. So without further ado, we can start with some introductions. Uh, my, my name is Derek Thomas. Uh, I work for Target as a engineer. Um, I started my career uh, actually in the Army, though, as an intelligence officer. Um, in 2013, I commissioned and I was active duty for a number of years. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, learning about intelligence and uh, continue to do it after I moved to the DC area as a contractor for FBI Cyber Division. Uh, there, I was responsible for tracking uh, cyber criminal uh, activity in underground marketplaces and forums. Uh, I really enjoyed learning the more technical aspect of how cyber criminals did their intrusions. And uh, from there, I started getting more and more certifications with cybersecurity, Network Plus, Security Plus, et cetera. Uh, and then ultimately uh, getting hired by Target as a cyber threats intelligence analyst. So for Target uh, in Minnesota, I was responsible for tracking financially motivated cyber criminals. Um, but this time more uh, their TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures, in order to stop breaches and aid our uh, detection team in creating detection to um, actually prevent their attacks. Uh, from there, I've since transitioned to being an engineer. So in addition to continuing to you know, work in our uh, cyber fusion center, which is kind of like a, a security operations center, a SOC, um, I'm now also developing some of the tools that our Intel analysts use on a day-to-day -day basis. Then I'll let uh, Paul introduce himself. Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Paul Hottemeyer. I've been a target for about five years now. Prior to that, for about five years, I was a consultant um, for U.S. government and uh, commercial sectors uh, doing threat hunting. That ultimately led to more incident response type rules, remediation, stuff like that. Um, but I liked the work we did, did at Target when I was a consultant, so I jumped on board and helped out doing uh, threat detection for them. I realized that uh, there was some benefits to doing some software development and kind of stood on the wings of someone else and kind of just went on from there, doing threat development and programming to try to make our uh, program a little bit stronger. So, yeah, thanks, Derek. Yeah, no worries. And I, I, I do want to mention, Paul is also the product owner of Shrelka at Target. Right. So uh, he's basically the subject matter expert in, in the tool now. Uh, looking at what we're going to do today, as far as the agenda goes, uh, we're going to cover what Yara is, give a lot of that background and overview. Um, there will also be an exercise just uh, to create a very basic rule. Uh, we do have some stretch goals for those exercises. Um, and so, you know, if you find yourself, you know, already have written YAR rules before, uh, maybe there's uh, some things in the lab environment that you can kind of play around with those YAR rules um, in the meantime for the, the quick five minutes that we'll give you to do these exercises. Uh, we'll also be going over how to collect intelligence with Yara. Um, so, you know, Yara is only as good as the files that you can use it against. And so uh, talking about where to find malicious files, benign files, um, and how to plug into those services is kind of essential to really using Yara in a, you know, production or, enter or enterprise or intelligence type function. And then Paul will talk about how to use Yara with Strelka. Um, again, Yara is a very powerful tool, but now that you have your files, maybe you're also interested in doing malware detection or detection of uh, interesting um, uh, activity, hunting or detection. Um, Shulka will help with that at an enterprise scale. 
so diving right into what Yara is, uh, it uh, was created by Victor Alvarez uh, in 2013. And it was first the pattern matching Swiss Army knife from our researchers. Uh, but Swiss Army knife is actually a copyrighted uh, branding term. And so they had to change the name, cross out the army, and now it's just the pattern matching Swiss knife uh, for malware researchers. Um, Yara stands for yet another recursive acronym, which uh, is not very uh, you know, telling as far as a name goes. Um, but I think a different definition could maybe be something like a command line tool which reads rules and prints matching files. Uh, said another way, Yara is a program which you can run via your command line. It takes in input in the form of a rule, and it, take, it also reads in a file that you specify and then prints whether or not that rule that you gave it matches that file. So it's all about pattern matching. The patterns that you define in the rules need to match the patterns that are read in from the files that you give it. Uh, it is developed by uh, Virus Total. I mentioned Victor Alvarez. He worked for uh, Chronicle, formerly Chronicle, now owned by Google. Um, it is multi-platform, Linux, Mac, uh, and uh, Linux, uh, Windows, Mac, and Linux. And it's, and it's fast. I put an asterisk there next to the fast because uh, Yara has some limitations um, in terms of how fast it can go. I believe it is slower than Suricata or Snort. Um, but in the past five years, Yara has actually had huge performance gains um, with each of its incremental releases. And so I expect it to catch up very quickly to other rule engine um, that are out there. And uh, some of the speed is also dependent on the actual rule author themselves. So uh, we'll, we'll get into this later, but certain logic in your rule will actually dictate, you know, some of the performance cost of Yara. So that's something to keep in mind is if your rule is performing slow, it could be that maybe it's not optimized on the rule logic itself. Uh, and then as far as the purposes of Yara, you know, you can use it for collection detection and informational. I've kind of touched on collection and detection, but um, in terms of collection, what I'm referring to is the ability to uh, specify items that are of intelligence value to your organization. Um, that might be you know, understanding a threat actor at a deeper level. That might be understanding malware at a deeper level, uh, identifying maybe certain file characteristics um, of a particular malware family. And then there's also detection value. So uh, in, in this example, you know, maybe you're interested in detecting all malicious activity, all files that do process injection. You want to make sure that your SIM is aware of that. Um, I've also seen people create uh, kind of like whitelists with YAR rules where they have profiled all the ELF files that should run on all their Linux servers. And if there's any ELF file that's not on that whitelist, which they have in the YAR rules, which are scanning their files, then they want to be notified about it. That would be kind of a detection opportunity. And then I have informational there just to say that Yara can also just be informational. Um, not every attribute of a file is worth collecting for intelligence or detecting in your, your SIM or your SOC, uh, but maybe you're just interested in knowing that the files are UPX packed. Um, that's something that can aid you in analyzing that file further um, and you know, also maybe give you an additional filter by which you can say, I want to go hunting based on these characteristics of files. Uh, so looking at a YAR rule example, um, this is kind of a lot to look at at first. Um, you know, it, it is C-like syntax, and I'll get into what that means. But if we break it down into its components, I think everyone here in this workshop will be able to write a YAR rule, um, even, if, even if it's a relatively simple one. Um, at, the, at, at a very basic level, there's only actually three requirements for a YAR rule. You have to have rule, R-U-L-E, and then a space, and then the rule name, and then the rule name is almost any set of uh, ASCII characters are accepted. And then either a space or the opening curly bracket denotes the end of the rule name and the start of the rule logic. So rule and then rule name and then the opening curly bracket. Okay. And then the closing and then I'm sorry. And then the condition inside of your curly brackets and then the closing curly bracket. Those are actually the only components of a rule that are required. So 
the most simple Yara rule that you could have would be something like this, rule test condition true. And so this isn't a particularly useful rule, right? This rule is going to literally match on every single file that it's scanned against. Um, and that's because the condition is just saying, evaluate true every time. You could also put false instead of true, then it wouldn't match no file. Um, this is just an example to show you what's actually required for a rule. Um, I mentioned earlier that YAR rules are written in C-like syntax. That means that they are not uh, white space sensitive. The bottom example there is the same as the top. Uh, they both compile, they both run, they both have the exact same logic. Difference is that there's, uh, as you can see, no indenting, no tabbing, no spaces, uh, no new lines. Um, but for best practices, it's obviously recommended that you do the more readable option, which is the top, um, and indent your rules accordingly uh, with each new line um, and each uh, section of the rule itself. Um, coming back out to uh, the example that we had earlier, um, you can see that we also have this meta section. Um, so this section is extremely important and I think oftentimes overlooked by a lot of rule authors. Um, it doesn't impact the logic of the rule. So nothing in this section is going to change the way that Yara um, matches a given rule against a file. However, it's very telling about the rule itself. Um, so if you've been writing YAR rules, uh, you may have experienced where you come back to a YAR rule that's no longer functioning or something else after years, and you realize, oh my gosh, this uh, rule it has really complicated regex. What was in it? Um, how, did I, how did I create it? So adding that information to the meta not only will remind you of how you created the rule, but it's also really useful if you share that rule out to others. Now they don't have to try and reverse engineer your logic in the strings and conditions. They can just say, oh, I know based on the meta that this was created by Derek Thomas on this day. It is the Malware family Carbonac. Uh, it's the actor uh, that uses this Malware family in Sphin 7. Oh, he provided hashes, which um, give, give uh, the rule which matches those files and also maybe the files where the rule was created from. And then uh, we, we at Target also have uh, these fields, uh, scope and Intel. Uh, scope is uh, what we consider to be detection, collection, and informational, kind of like what I went over before. And that's important because we wouldn't want to produce a rule for hunting and then share it with someone and then plug it into their SIM and say, your YAR rules are horrible. They're blowing up our SIM. Well. That's because the scope of a given Yara rule may or may not be intended for a sim. Uh, we also include the Intel links um, where the uh, hashes are usually found from. And so, uh, you know, we are also doing the traffic light protocol up at the top, the TLP. Uh, this is a first conference, so I assume most of you are probably familiar with TLP. Um, but that would tell anyone that you share this rule with who they can share it with additionally outside of you. So white would be open, feel free to share widely. Um, and then we're also formatting, if you look at the hashes, the scope and the Intel, it, it, it looks kind of odd because we have uh, quotations and then we have a bracket and then a single quote and denoting our values. It kind of looks like a list if you're familiar with different programming languages or an array, um, but it's actually still just a string, right? Cause it's, it's got that double quotes in the front. So the meta field in YAR rules is always going to be denoted by the meta with a colon and then the field name space equals space and then your quotes and then your value. So it's always going to be a string in Yara. Now, why do we include these special symbols if it's all just a string anyway? Well, it's because that's how we're internally formatting them. So these are of value to us, and this is how we've chosen to standardize our formatting of the meta information. You certainly don't have to do that. You can do uh, just a hash, a single hash. You could do a hash with separated by a space or separated by a comma. The meta, the entire meta section is entirely up to you. Remember, it's not required. It's to help you and to help others understand your rule. Uh, looking at the strings in, in a rule, you can see that uh, we start out with the strings word 
and then the colon, and then a dollar sign denotes the beginning of a string. And then S1 is going to be the string identifier. And then space equals space again. And then the actual value for that string identifier. Now you don't have to have a string identifier. You can just do a, a dollar sign and then dollar sign equals whatever your, 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 your value for that string. However, that limits you to having to reference all of the strings or none of the strings uh, e explicitly. So you have no way to distinguish between one string to another. It's almost always considered a best practice to give all of your strings an identifier, S1, S2, S3, et cetera. Um, something that you know makes sense for you, that you, that you will be able to use in your logic. Um, and in that way, you'll be able to differentiate between the different strings if you need to. In terms of the different uh, types of strings that are available to you when writing your rules, you can see we have uh, just simple quotes and then example. This is literally looking for the word example. And if you didn't have any of these qualifiers here on the right, if you just had example, that would be an ASCII string, also called UTF-8, um, which is inside of any given file. Um, and we'll get into how to look at strings inside of files a little bit later. but. Uh, for now, just kind of think about how we're looking for the word example inside of a file. Well, by putting this wide qualifier on it, we're saying don't look at it in the UTF-8 strings, look at it in UTF-16 strings, also called Unicode strings sometimes. Um, that is going to be uh, important to know whether or not a string is ASCII or Unicode. And then no case. So by default, if you just had example with no qualifiers, it would be case sensitive. It would only be looking for example uh, in lowercase in UTF-8 strings. So here we're saying make it case insensitive and look for it in UTF-16 strings. Um, keep in mind that by adding no case, there is a slight performance cost to that. It is basically the equivalent of now doing example with a capital E or example with a capital X, or example with a capital E and a capital X, et cetera. Every possible iteration of example with capital or lowercase uh, letters. Uh, for uh, another example, we have uh, S2, and then we have uh, forward slashes. The forward slashes denote the start of regex. I believe Yara uses Perl-based regex. And you can uh, see that you can get as complicated as you want with the regex. Uh, you can do wild carding. Um, it's generally recommended that you avoid wild carding, do a reasonable value or range for your uh, logic in regex. Um, and that's because there's usually a very large performance cost to regex. Um, so whereas I mentioned that there's a performance cost to using no case, it's, it's usually exponential for regex as you use more complicated and more wild cards in regular expressions. So if you're not familiar with doing re regular expressions, I would definitely recommend that as a precursor to Yara. Um, they're very powerful. They give you the ability to detect things like obfuscation in malware, um, where maybe strings aren't available to you in a readable format such as this, but maybe the formats of the strings themselves have a certain pattern to them. And in that way, you're almost learning the, at an abstract level, how to do Yara by learning regular expressions. Since regular expressions themselves are just logic which matches a given set of data, so Yara is also pattern matching using regular expressions as one uh, offering. Uh, FP1 here, you can see is another string that we have. And this one is a little strange because again, we have our dollar sign then our identifier, then a space equals space, and then curly brackets, and then hexadecimal characters, and then closing curly brackets. Um, this is a curly brackets inside of our opening curly brackets, which denoted the start of our rule logic. And uh, this is the ability for you to specify bytes. So it's possible that you're interested in a, a sequence of bytes in a file and not just a sequence of strings. Uh, however, you would still put that in the strings section of the YAR rule, since that's where you basically are looking at the file content. 
Looking at uh, the condition section, um, I mentioned that it's possible to make a YAR rule with just a condition section. You don't have to have strings, so strings are technically optional. However, it's most YAR rules, generally speaking, have some types of, of, of strings. Um, it's not always the case, especially if you're dealing with characteristics or informational YAR rules. Um, and you also have the ability to specify location of bytes solely in the condition, which is actually slightly faster. And so if anyone's familiar with uh, portable executable files and writing YAR rules for them, you've probably seen this before where you have uint16 and that, sign, that stands for unsigned integer. Uh, and then the first 16 bits or two bytes. Um, and then I'm using big Indian here. I believe the default is little Indian. And then we're saying at location zero is what this uh, syntax means right here. And we're setting an equals equals to our sequence of hex bytes. So uh, hex bytes in this case would be 45A. That's the MZ file header associated with portable executables or DLL files. Um, so again, with condition, we're going to have the word condition, colon, and then the start of your logic. You don't have to have uh, any of the operators or uh, logic that I have here. You can, of course, just do something like true, and that would return all files. Very common is just to say all of them. Anytime that you reference all of them, them is referring to strings, since that's kind of the core of what the R rule is using for its uh, uh, pattern matching logic. Um, you can also say none of them, or you can say all of certain ones, and then you can specify which ones you're interested in. So here I have parentheses around dollar sign, which denotes a string identifier, and then S, and then a wildcard. So you can actually wildcard and say all of the S strings, so S1 and S2, and then I have a logic operator that says and not dollar sign FP1. So that's basically say Right, we're looking for portable executable files. And the logic and operator says also evaluate this condition to be true. Right, the file size is underneath a certain size. That's based on the meta information of the file. And meaning this condition also has to match all of the first two strings. Okay, and not FP1. So, a common uh, example of how a rule like this would get created is. Maybe I looked at these two hashes from this intelligence report by FireEye. You know, I created my meta. I said, all right, I'm going to create a YAR rule for Fin7 Carbonac malware family. And uh, I know that they're always, every single time I've, I've evaluated their malware, it's always like 25 kilobytes. So it's never going to be above 500 kilobytes. I'm, I'm pretty certain of that. Um, that's a reasonable assumption to make based on characteristics of the malware and also performance. So we want to make sure we're not scanning files that are hundreds of megabytes uh, large. This is a logic condition that immediately takes those files out of the equation. Um, we also can say, right, only portable executable files. So that these two conditions immediately filter out, I'd say probably the vast majority of files, um, or at least a very large chunk of files. And that's even before we've gotten into our pattern matching. And that gives Yara the ability to you know, operate much quicker than if it were to have to scan every single file every single time to its, you know, to its file end. So once we have a, a portable executable, once we, or, or DLL, and the file size is less than 500 kilobytes, right? we want these two strings. Now, what probably happened here is that I created uh, the rule with two strings, right? And then FP standing for false positive one. There's probably a false positive that I was told about. Maybe someone contacted me and said, hey, it also matches this other file. Well, I simply looked at some of the bytes of what makes that file and other files like it, uh, you know, a false positive, and then included that sequence of hex bytes. Um, again, this is, uh, you know, could, could be updated in the meta. Right, I could you you could feel free to add a section that says something like false positives, and then have a list of false positives that you encounter as your rule matures. Uh, you could also have an updated field to say maybe date created is equal to this, uh, but the updated field is this. All of this is completely uh, up to you in terms of how you want to create your R rule. 
Um, I do want to briefly touch on some of the Yara modules. Uh, there's a number of them available, I think like seven or eight now. Uh, there's third party ones and you can actually create your own. Um, very, very cool functionality. Uh, if you think about, uh, you know, I'm talking about portable executables in the last couple slides, there's actually a PE module. Uh, you would do that by typing, you know, import space and then quotes PE and closing quotes before you define your rules. Then that gives you the ability in your condition to say PE dot and then call any of the number of uh, fields in the PE module and evaluate whether or not those fields and those values are true. Um, that's very well documented on the Yara main site, uh, as is Yara functionality in general. Uh, there's examples of almost all different types of Yara rules that you can create and the logic therein on the Yara documentation. So I strongly suggest that at some point during this class, you Google uh, Yara documentation, look at the latest documentation and, and peruse it as you get time. Uh, you can see that uh, there's a rule here is DLL um, it, with the condition of PE.characteristics and PE.DLL. Um, there's also one for is PE, uh, and that might be helpful for you in the first exercise. So again, if you're looking for how to create a YAR rule that detects PE files, you can look at a PE file. You can pull up the Microsoft PE documentation. You can find the exact bits at the location based on the offsets of where you know certain bytes should exist to verify that it's a PE and not a DLL or this or that. But the owner of and the maintainer of the PE module has already done a lot of that work for you. You can actually just leverage their work by importing this library. Um, yeah. So we are ready to start our first exercise. Um, quick uh you know note here on the range uh the range is going to be open i see we have uh under the maximum number of participants which is great uh, i believe we have stress tested it for this amount of people so it, it should be fully operational um you will navigate to the site uh that is there and paul will post the uh the, the link to it if he hasn't already yep we're good yep looks like he has great and uh, you can log in using the credentials on your screen. Uh, this uh, exercise is going to be very simple. Now, we're going to be dealing with guacamole. Okay, guacamole, if you're not familiar with it, um, has a number of different uh, plugins, but we're using SSH. And so you're going to have a terminal in your browser. There's going to be some inherent limitations with that. Tab complete does work. Copy and paste, though, is very finicky. It, it sometimes will work, but sometimes it'll like also kind of paste into your terminal when you copy and vice versa. Um, you know, nothing that we're doing should really require copying and pasting large amounts of data. So it shouldn't really be much of an issue. Uh, also, please don't hack our lab. Um, we are monitoring uh, logins and commands being run during our lab. Uh, if you want to hack it, uh, talk to us afterwards and we can point you to the infrastructure and uh, the open source repo that we're hosting it on, and you can play around with it after we're done. But uh, please don't be disruptive to the other students in this lab environment. Um, we're all, all going to be sharing one infrastructure uh, and, and one box with which we're all learning on. So please don't be disruptive to the other students or else we'll just have to fall back to uh, showing you this rather than you actually getting hands-on exercise. So for this hands-on exercise, uh, you'll navigate to the exercise one directory. You will then create a Yara rule that matches PE files, right? I've been talking about PE files. I kind of talked about some of the syntax for Yara rules. Um, you're probably going to be needing to do some Googling. So strongly recommend that you pull up the Yara documentation. Strongly recommend that you look at different examples of how other people have matched PE files. You have strings at your disposal. You have hex bytes at your disposal. You have the PE module at your disposal. Um, as long as you create one rule, the exercise is considered complete. Um, in order to do that, you do have Vim, Nano, and V available to you as text editors uh, in the terminal. And then as a stretch goal, uh, consider adding tags, adding some of the meta, uh, try different methods, not just the PE module, maybe try using some strings or something else to identify PE files. 
Uh, and then, you know, if you're ready, if you accomplish all that, try scanning the uh, malware directory in your home directory using your YAR rule. Um, you can do that by running Yara. It's pre-installed for you. Uh, use the dash H to see the help uh, commands if you need. And then, um, you know, go from there, look at the arguments that are required um, or look at the documentation, but it's gonna be Yara, your rule, and then the location that you wanna scan, which in this case is home forward slash uh, malware. Okay, we'll, we'll go ahead and take uh, maybe five minutes to do this exercise. And Derek, there's a quick question about best practices for Yara as well. Sure. If you don't mind checking that out. Yeah, so uh, someone asked if there is a best practice for Yara on how you define uh, a list on the meta information. I'm not aware of a best practice um, that, that specifies uh, how meta should be formatted. This is something that should definitely be discussed in an organization where multiple people are writing YAR rules though. Um, this is something that we have internal parsers for. And so standardization of, of data requires us to enforce it and also parse it in a standardized way. And so um, it's really just something that's internal to each organization. Uh, feel free to adopt ours uh, if you liked how uh, that, that rule was formatted on some of the earlier slides when we send these slides out. You know, feel free to adopt that, but I'm not aware of a universal standard. If, if you're not familiar with Linux, I, I do also want to say that we will be doing a walkthrough of these exercises afterwards. So don't feel like you need to sign off because you're not going to get any value. We will walk through the answers. Okay, it's been roughly five minutes. Does anyone need more time? You can simply put in the chat if you do or if you're done. We can kind of just get a gauge of that. Okay. Great. Great. Looks like we have quite a few people that are finished. So we'll go ahead and uh, walk through the answer. Feel free to keep working on these exercises um, if you need to. Um, my screen is gonna be very small if I share it that way. So let me share it this way. Um, so on this one, uh, do you guys see a terminal here with uh, the exercises? Yep. Great. So the exercise asks you to first CD into exercise one directory. There is this example uh, file in here, um, right? I pulled some of these out of the Yara documentation just to kind of give you some of the syntax if you needed to, um, you know, kind of what we went over in some of the beginning of slides. But our exercise is asking us to write one that uh, matches uh, PE files. And so Yara rules can have the .yar or .yara extension, doesn't really matter. Um, I'll use Vim to open it up and say, uh, first I'll use the PE module. So I could do import PE. And then I could say, maybe we'll uh, answer PE module. I could make my rule name what I want. And then I'll do a new line with the curly bracket and then the closing brackets. And then I can simply say condition and then tab it in, say PE.isPE. .pe. Now I would only know that if I Googled Yara PE module documentation and went to the first link and then saw, oh, the very first thing they give you is some examples of how to use it. There's all these other options as well, but for our purpose, we're just looking at PE is PE. So that, that should be sufficient. I can write quit, clear my terminal to make it pretty again, and then uh, if I wanted to look at how to run Yara, right, I could just do Yara dash H, tells me all the different options. It shows me the mandatory options. Um, you must have a, a, a rules file and then either a file or directory or a PID that you pass it to. And then I can run Yara answer dot Yara, whatever directory I want. So there's no PEs in my current directory, but if I back out to the malware directory, 
I can see that there's a number of uh, PEs in the malware directory. And sure enough, I can, if guacamole cooperates here, I can copy one of them and run the Linux file utility to get the MIME type. And we can confirm it is indeed a PE. Um, so this Derek, is circa. yeah, I, go ahead. I, I have a, a, a comment I want to make just because this is a question I've gotten a lot as well. Um, when, when you do match on a YAR rule, it doesn't tell you where it matches. Right, it just says this file is a match for this rule. So if you have a little more right. of a com complicated rule, where it's like I'm looking for a specific piece of a uh, of a file, YAR won't show you where in that file it matched. So you have to kind of do a little more digging. This is just to say, hey, this file, good to go. Take a closer look. Yeah, absolutely. Some some things that I do love uh, as far as troubleshooting that goes though is sometimes this uh, dash small s uh, option that'll print the matching strings if any. Um, I don't have any strings in my R rule right now, so it won't. But I can demonstrate that later when I do. Um, but there's also this really cool option um, where it'll actually print out the entire uh, do 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 module data uh, dash capital D, and this is very handy to see what other attributes I could use to detect on the PE module. So I kind of briefly scrolled down to say, look at all these other fields you can match on. Well, it's hard to know what these fields are in a file. By importing the module and then running that rule against a file, you can then see what those values are for each of the files. So this can get really powerful where, in addition to matching a given set of strings, for a malware family, maybe you can match some of these other characteristics based on the PE uh, module. Um, that wasn't a direct answer to the point you brought up, but just something I thought of. <laughs> and then I'll pull back the slides. So the answer, uh, you guys are able to see the answers again now? Yep, you're good. OK, uh, you can see that um, there's different examples here uh, of some possible answers you could have had. Um, of course, the first one being the hex uh, based on the uh, unsigned integers. Um, the second one being the actual string MZ. And then you can also specify a location. I didn't really go over that, but some of you may have seen this before, but you can say MZ at 0. Um, that's, that, that works as well. Slightly less performant than the first rule, but uh, it's it's pretty marginal. And then, of course, what we did today was the import PE module and then do PE dot is PE. All right, so uh, we have officially written our first YAR rule. Maybe for some of you, it sounds it sounds like maybe not. It sounds like some of you maybe uh, crushed that pretty quick. Um, that's good. If not, that's fine too. Feel free to work on the exercise uh, when we have more time. We'll have uh, significantly more time on this next exercise. Um, so you can go back and complete that one if you need to as well. Uh, but next I wanna talk about collecting intelligence. So, you know, detecting portable executables, not so useful, right? We could just use the built-in file utility to do that and look at the MIME type or something like that. But now we're going to actually dive into malware, right? Because that's what most people are using Yara for. Um, being able to analyze malware to find unique strings is a skill. It's, it's not a skill that requires a um, particularly technical you know, skill set. You have to have the malware, and then you have to be able to run certain tools to extract out the strings that you find are unique. Now, uniqueness. Um, is going to depend on you know how how you go about finding them, and everyone has a different technique. So uh, I've seen some people uh, reverse engineer malware, and in that way they discover what sequence of byte strings or what sequence of uh, you know ASCII strings or compiler strings or attributes of the file are exactly representative of what that malware's capabilities are. And then you know they they queue into that, and th that produces very high fidelity and very high fidelity YAR rules. However, it's also a lot of work. 
Um, I've also seen people where they simply take a given uh, malware set where they know all these samples are trick bot or something like that. And they just, you know, uh, take all the strings that match all of those files. And then they take a given set of, um, of uh, benign files that they know are always going to be benign. And then they diff the lists and they say, only give me the trick bot strings. Don't give me any of the benign strings. And uh, that's exactly what a lot of uh, Yara generator tools do, um, such as Florian Ross uh, Yargen, I believe. So finding the unique strings is going to depend largely on the analysts and how they go about doing that. Sometimes it involves reverse engineering the malware sample. Sometimes it's pretty glaringly obvious. Um, it just depends on the malware and it depends on oftentimes how familiar you are with the strings. Looking at the strings inside of a file can be overwhelming because usually there's hundreds or thousands upon thousands of strings. Uh, it's, it's important to note that uh, there are many, many of them are just automatically generated by the compiler. Uh, you know, that's not necessarily, especially like Go compiled files. Most of those strings are not going to be unique. You know, they're not going to be strings that we're interested in. Uh, many of them are also API calls. So operating systems, the developers of those operating systems have certain APIs with which uh, application creators can interface to do something like drop a file. So I, I want my application to be able to write to the temp directory Right, I've got to call certain Windows API functions. Those are usually going to appear as strings in my application, unless I do something like obfuscate them or something else. Um, and so those aren't necessarily going to be unique either. Right? It gives you a given set of capability of a file, like maybe the fact that it calls certain Windows APIs. But those strings are also going to appear in other applications that have that same functionality. Let's keep that in mind, too. And then, of course, uh, many strings are going to be obfuscated. Um, however, maybe you can detect the obfuscation itself. So if you know that a uh, given malware family always has a set of 64 uh, length hexadecimal bytes that appear in the strings of a sample uh, containing a certain pattern, well, that's kind of odd. It's odd that it would always be a certain length. Maybe there's a certain number. You have the ability to do that with Yara. You can say, you know, at least 20 strings that are this exact length matching this exact regex. Now, detecting obfuscation, and I talked about regex, there's a performance cost to that. Um, and so sometimes that can get kind of complicated. And if they modify their obfuscation, which often uh, happens with malware authors, well, then uh, you're, right, you're going to have to modify your Yara rule accordingly as well. There's definitely an element of cat and mouse to writing YAR rules because you're going to key in on something that makes this malware what it is. And then the malware authors are eventually going to be, be getting detected. They're obviously going to change their files to not be detected anymore. And then uh, you're back to square one writing a YAR rule or at least up updating it. Um, Really good way to write YAR rules is take samples from different time frames. So don't just pull all of the trick bot that you have from one exact date or even two dates. Try to get as many samples as you can across uh, a lot of different dates and then see you know, what strings are common across maybe samples spanning six months or spanning a year or spanning multiple years. Uh, trick bot in particular is a, is a family that is uh, updated very often. And so there might be very little code overlap and very little string overlap um, or byte overlap or other uh, characteristic overlap um, from five years ago. That, that's just something that you know most malware families uh, are not at that same pace as TrickBot. And so spanning a large time frame is generally speaking good and will work for you well. But if you literally can't find anything that matches TrickBot from five years ago compared to TrickBot today, that's fine. It's, it's possible that it's almost a completely different malware family, even though it has, you know, it's still considered TrickBot. So oftentimes malware, uh, Yara rules for malware family can detect a certain version of that malware, and that's okay too. Um, so looking at what tools are available to you, um, and, and I have more slides on more tools. This is just very basic. Uh, I talked about how, you know, it's not a very technical skill set 
because it's built into Linux. You can literally run strings. It's built into Linux. Uh, well, I should say certain operating system versions of Linux, since there's a million flavors out there. But for um, uh, for Ubuntu, you can do strings. You can do your file. It doesn't have to be a PE. We're, we're doing a lot of work with PEs. Uh, but it could be any file. It could be a JSON file. It could be anything. Um, if you run strings against that file, it will then print out all the strings. Um, you can see that it tells you a lot about a file just to look at the strings. Um, you can see that you know this program cannot be run in DOS mode, right? That tells you that it's it's a Windows uh, executable file. You can see it's got the .txt, the resource, the relock uh, sections there. You can see that it's got the hashtag strings, GUID, the blob, right? That's usually uh, indicative of some type. Usually something compiled in .net or or C sharp, something like that. Um, you can see the tools.dll. That's probably like the internal file name in that tool in that file. Um, and then you can see down at the bottom, you have that virtual alloc, create thread, get execute code thread. Um, those are Windows API functions. Those of you familiar with process injection probably recognize some of those API calls. Um, but again, that tells you a lot about the file, right? We, we, we've already learned that, right? It runs on Windows. It's, it's some sort of executable. We have an indication that maybe it was written in a certain language and it accesses certain Windows API calls that look like maybe it's doing process injection. So uh, being able to key in on those with YAR rules for informational purposes at a minimum, and then maybe, uh, you know, um, detection, uh, you know, down, down the road. Looking at the other strings, you know, that's going, a lot of that's going to come with experience and time in terms of knowing that, uh, you know, certain strings have a certain meaning, um, you know, and that's just something that comes with experience, but also comes with looking at malware family uh, strings together so that you know these strings, you, you start to see the patterns um, across the, the malware family samples. And we'll kind of have an example that, that demonstrates that. Um, once you have a list of strings, so let's say that you've run strings against a uh, trick bot for today and trick bot from last week, uh, there's a tool called listdiff. Now listdiff.com, this tool was not created with malware researchers in mind. It is not a cybersecurity tool. It is just a tool that uh, takes a list of words and another list of words and then tells you whether or not uh, the words in column A are all the same as uh, column B. And it'll tell you what words it has in common, which ones are in list A only or list B only, and et cetera. And then you can actually see what strings are common across both samples. So this is a powerful tool to see what's uh, common strings across malware samples. Um, and then you can obviously uh, programmatically do it as well um, using something like diff uh, on the Linux command line as well. Uh, other tools which uh, can help you, uh, floss. So before I talked about the strings utility, by default, the strings utility will only print out UTF string or UTF-8 strings. That's gonna be ASCII strings, uh, not Unicode. There is a command line argument that you can pass to get Unicode strings, or you can use floss. Floss is a uh, tool that was developed by FireEye. This will produce both UTF-8 strings and UTF-16. So both ASCII and wide and also stack strings. So powerful tool there, um, you know, feel free to look into it and, and see the advantages that it offers. Uh, String Sifter is another one. This uses, uh, this is also created by FireEye, uses machine learning to rank the strings. Uh, this is going to help prioritize uniqueness. So I kind of mentioned that uh, with experience comes the ability to distinguish unique strings from commonplace strings. Well, String Sifter kind of does some of that for you. They're, FireEye is trying to, you know, they're in the business of looking at strings of files and they're trying to make it easier for analysts to do that job. Uh, and then lastly, I wanna talk about a tool which I've produced. Uh, this is called String Finder. Uh, this is uh, now open sourced and it will be in the uh, lab environment for you. And we'll have links to it afterwards in the reference section as well. But this is going to produce both this, this tool produces both ASCII and wide strings, if applicable, and it uh, will do it across multiple malware uh, samples. So whereas the previous tools will accept a file as input and then print out the strings, this can accept multiple files. This can actually accept a directory with 
however many files you put in there. And then it'll print out the shared strings across all of those malware samples. And it does it in a Yara friendly way. This tool I built for Yara to create Yara rules. So if you have uh, five different samples of TrickBot, uh, all from different time frames, it'll print out whether or not there's shared strings across all of those different five samples. This tool is going to be located in the path for your next exercise, and it can definitely help you uh, complete the exercise. Uh, I very briefly want to touch on malware services um, before we take our break here uh, with the exercise. We'll probably do the two in, in conjunction. Um, but malware services are essential to understanding uh, what value you can derive from Yara. So, you know, we've been talking a lot about how you can use Yara to detect files or identify files. Well, if you don't have files to begin with, you're not going to go very far or you only have benign files. So being able to get malware is essential to you know, ultimately deriving Intel value for your organization. Uh, looking at VirusTotal first, uh, VirusTotal uh, is a free and also paid offering. The free offering is very limited in that you're able to upload, you're able to see the results of other people's uploads, but you cannot download as far as I'm aware. You cannot uh, do some of the more complicated searching and you can't do much with Yara. Uh, once you have a paid offering with VirusTotal, however, you have the ability to upload a Yara rule see if anyone else's files match that Yara rule, they'll send you a notification. And you also have the ability to do something called a retro hunt, where if you uh, upload a Yara rule, it will actually scan all the previously uploaded samples from VirusTotal. And then of course you can download those samples or research further. They also have the ability to do content searching. So you can look for certain strings. If you're not sure if a string is unique or not, can be very helpful for a fledging Yara rule author to say, you know, is this a common string or not? Or is this used in other applications? Simply one search away with that content colon uh, word operator will tell you whether or not, you know, it's seen in one file or a million files. Uh, Pastebin uh, is another service which uh, has uh, malware on it. Uh, again, this is not something that was created for malware authors or researchers or, or anything of the, of the like, but it's abused by uh, malware authors. Um, most people in, in this workshop are probably familiar with Pastebin being abused. Um, it is uh, a almost free offering, and I say almost free because in order to use the API, you do have to have kind of a paid account, um, which they offer periodically, and it's a very cheap, usually five to fifty dollars, depending on if it's in sale. Um, but once you have your API key and a pro account, you can then scrape Pastebin, download the files, and then scan them with Yara. Pastebin natively doesn't have the ability for you to upload a file like VirusTotal does, and so you have to instead download the files and store them locally. Uh, you can see I have a screenshot of Scumbots. Uh, Scumbots uh, is a hashtag on Twitter. Um, created by Paul Melson, and it is doing this exact work. It is uh, scraping Pastebin, downloading the pastes from Pastebin, scanning them with YAR rules. If it matches a YAR rule, tweeting out what YAR rule it matched, and then extracting out other indicators of intelligence value from it, uh, such as in this case, the command and control for uh, async rat, which is detected. Uh, another uh, malware offering, and this one's probably one of my favorites, uh, it's kind of up and coming, is going to be Abuse CH's Malware Bazaar. Uh, this is completely free. They have gigabytes of malware uh, that are posted. Um, they're in a uh, compressed zip archive, uh, and this is accessible to anyone. You, can, you don't need to even hit an API. You can do it in their, uh, their web interface. Uh, you can also submit or download files um, individually. Uh, it does, of course, require, if you're going to do Yara scanning, it does require you to download the files first and then scan them with Yara rules. Uh, it doesn't have the ability for you to upload your Yara rule since that would require more processing on their end. Um, but it does give you signatures, tags, and tell you a lot of information about the malware family. So if you're interested in, in a lot of the commodity malware families, which are uh, hitting organizations every day, such as TrickBot um, or Iced ID or, or QBot and such, uh, they have those tags available, they have those signatures available, and you can uh, download those malware files associated with that and produce your own YAR rules for your own organization. Uh, lastly, I wanted to touch on hybrid analysis. Uh, this is a free tool uh, with sign up. You have to create a free account. 
it, it's a sandbox. So usually people are trying to do a little bit deeper malware analysis with it. Um, it's going to have less files than some of the other ones that I've mentioned, especially virus total. Um, but it's still great for rule validation and testing because unlike the other, un unlike the other free offerings, you're able to upload a YAR rule to their site to do a search. Now, of course, you know, you wouldn't want to upload a TLP red YAR rule, but I think that goes without saying. Um, but the advantage here is that there's no storage needed uh, to scan files on hybrid analysis. Uh, you can simply upload your, your YAR rule. Um, then uh, one special mention that uh, we had, ha have just started uh, researching further and uh, I haven't had a lot of time to play with yet, but triage uh, is another up and coming uh, sandbox and also gives you the ability to upload YAR rules and scan them. Um, and, and that's, uh, I, I believe, in, invite only. So we are ready to, so maybe before I begin, is there a question in the chat? No, okay, great, just, just links to scumbots, great. Um, so for our, our next exercise, uh, we are again going to be using the exact same infrastructure. So this time we'll be in exercise two directory. Um, so if you're in exercise one, maybe CD to your home directory and then CD to exercise two. And inside, inside that exercise two directory, you'll see two files. You'll see uh, Intrigue Canada VBS and Intriguing France VBS. If you want to, you can run the MD5 sum on them and, and verify that the hashes are good, but it should be good to go. Um, Go ahead and look at the strings of these files and create a YAR rule. Um, I would implore you to try doing that on your own if you can. This is live malware, um, so you know, treat it as such. Don't uh, don't don't try to execute it or something. Um, <laughs> uh, just create a YAR rule from it. Look at the strings, and then try to find the third file in the malware directory um, that is likely in the same family. So try to find what makes this malware unique. Try to find those unique strings, create a YAR rule, and then scan that malware directory. Now, when you're looking at the strings, there's going to be, like I said, thousands upon thousands of strings. I recommend you pipe the output of something like strings uh, to something like more. The more tool will allow you to scroll through the strings very easily. It, it, it'll work in Guacamole, and, and that, that'll work well for you. Try to find those unique strings. You don't want to just necessarily look at the ending strings, especially in this case, because these files are very heavily obfuscated. Um, if you want to, you can try to detect the obfuscation, um, or you can try to just pick out certain keywords and functionality. That, that, that'll work as well. Um, and then a, a final tip, maybe, with this one, uh, you can use the String Finder tool. Uh, all you need to do is uh, type capital S-T-R, uh, just as it's in highlighted red on the slide there and it should pop up. It's in your path. So um, as long as you're in that directory, it'll produce strings for you. Um, but also try to just create the rule without relying on automated um, string generators as well. Try to, try to identify what's unique about the files. Uh, we'll maybe take a break with this exercise um, and then maybe skip the third one since I think we're a little bit shorter on time than I was hoping. So. So do you want to give, I guess, you know, combine the time you spend on two with a break, mm -hmm. 20 minutes or so? Yeah, let's do that. Let's do re reconvene maybe at 925. And then mm -hmm. we'll do a quick walk through of this. And then is that enough time for you, Paul? Or do you yeah, want to do 920? Yeah. No, 20, 20, 25 is fine. 25 okay. after. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll reconvene at uh, 925 then. Feel free to post any questions or if you uh, run into roadblocks with this exercise. Uh, this one is uh, supposed to challenge you much more than the first one. Um, so post any uh, concerns or questions you have. You can chat us individually or post it in the Q&A. All right, I think we're pretty close to time. I'll go ahead and start doing the demo now. Does everyone see my, my terminal in exercise two? I can see it. Great. So you're in exercise two directory uh, from your home directory. And you can see there's two files in here, just like the instructions uh, asked for. Uh, first, we'll solve this the hard way and then quickly solve it the 
um, what you, using the string generator tool. So if we look at uh, one of these files, I'll pick one at random. Uh, if I just run strings on it, there's a lot of strings. And uh, I don't have that, that much time to look at all those strings. So if I pipe it to more, um, you can see my command there. Uh, this gives me the ability to easily scroll up or down and uh, you know, even by page, et cetera, to kind of get a better idea of what strings are available to me. Um, right off the bat, I can see that this is VBS uh, based on some of the syntax, if you're familiar with VBS. If not, that's fine too. They were also, the files were named .VBS, so that, that would give you a hint. Um, and you can see these are obviously obfuscated strings. Um, they're, they're setting variables equal to string values and then decoding them from there. Now you could certainly detect the obfuscation using something like regex. Uh, I don't think that strings this long and maybe following this uh, type of pattern are very common, um, especially setting very long strings equal to things like uh, numbers inside of uh, quotes as a string. That's kind of interesting. But there's also this like RGB, which kind of stands out to me as, as something interesting as well. So what I can do is if I uh, copy this, uh, and let's see if guacamole cooperates with me and I can paste it, it did. So rather than create a YAR rule, a quick tip, and I have not mentioned this, so no worries if, if you weren't aware of this, you can actually just use grep. Uh, and grep has a lot of different command line arguments. Uh, dash lowercase i is case insensitive. R is recursive. And then uh, lowercase l is uh, list the file. Don't actually print out the output. Uh, you can do that and whatever string you're interested in, and then it'll tell you the matching file. So kind of like a little miniature Yara pattern matcher, right? Um, but just for a single string. Uh, you could of course combine it with other grep pipes and such to make it a little more complicated. Of course, Yara has more functionality um, and I believe is faster. So definitely use Yara, don't try, to, don't try to run grep across your entire en enterprise or something to that extent. But if I, if I do that and I search uh, my malware, uh, directory, I can see that already just based on one string that I pulled out, I have my answer. There's the third file that's related in the malware directory. Um, so of course I was asked to create a yar rule. So if I did something like uh, vim answer.yar, I could say uh, insert and then rule, we'll say answer and we'll do an opening curly and a closing curly and we'll say strings. And then our string identifier S1 is equal to, uh, oh, I didn't save it. Um, I believe it was RGB with a parenthesis. And then my condition can just be all of them. I'll save this file. And then we can do answer, scan the malware directory. Uh, let me see if that was the right string. equals RGB, not RBG. This is why I copy and paste is always preferred for strings. RGB, save the file and scan it. And again, I see in my malware directory, I have three files now instead of just two, uh, all matching my YAR rule. Now, the other way you could have done it was using String Finder. Now I've created a YAR rule in my directory and this is going, and, and uh, this issue came up with someone, they, they brought it to my attention. Um, once you create another file in a directory, String Finder, if you look at the help options, it's going to be a program that prints matching strings for files in a given directory. So now I have three files. It's going to try to print the matching strings for all three files in this directory. And I don't want that because my YAR rule, of course, has strings and it's not going to match the other strings in the actual malware. So if I remove my answer YAR rule that I created, I also could have copied it to a different directory. Um, I can then run string finder and see all of my ASCII strings that are shared across those two files. Um, again, we can see now that we have uh, a lot of options here, some of which should definitely pop out to you. Uh, Margarita Sexy is one that uh, immediately stood out to me. Uh, this Execute Astera one, that also stands out to me, Margarita Sexy Connect, um, right? The malware author is obviously uh, having some fun here. So you can definitely key in on what they're doing there with their variable names. Um, again, I can do a quick grep to say grep-irl, uh, look at the malware directory, 
um, for that string, uh, margarita sexy. And sure enough, we can see that is a unique string. And then we can add that string to the yar rule and scan the directory and see the same thing. Um, if you wanted to look at the output of string finder from here, you could, of course, pipe it to a different directory. So you could put it back in your home directory and say something like uh, string finder output. Now I can analyze the output of string finder without interrupting being able to run it again if I need to. So uh, just a quick note on how string finder works there. The other option, of course, is to use the dash D directory uh, run option. It's optional. The default is just your current working directory. So you have some options there to play around with string finder to get that uh, syntax right. Um, this uh, malware family was active uh, from 2019 to 2020. Uh, it was used by a variety of different commodity families. Um, I call it Margarita Sexy. Um, but it was an initial loader for other malware families. Okay. If anyone has any questions on exercise two, uh, let me know and um, you know, put, paste it in the chat and I'll, and I'll answer you. But I think we're going to have to move on uh, past exercise three even to Stroka. All right. Everyone see my screen? Gotcha. Cool. All right. Let me get a little laser pointer. OK, so for the uh, second part of this lecture, uh, we'll be looking at a file analysis platform called Strelka and how it can provide insight into files on and traversing throughout your network. Um, we'll also well, this is a Yara presentation, so we'll also cover how Yara or Strelka uses Yara to help us identify file types and tag files that match any signatures that we provided. Uh, but I did want to take a step back uh, and provide a primer on files and their content. So this is going to be a refresher for most of you, um, but this, this will help kind of gauge what we're doing with Strelka. Um, now, specifically in the next few minutes, right, I'm going to be highlighting typical files seen on endpoints, uh, networks, and just for a little bit of specificity, uh, email, we'll go into that in a minute. So let's take a look at what some of these files are. Um, some of the files in the endpoint network email buckets are going to include things like uh, and executables and archives and shortcuts in this endpoint bucket. Uh, Traversing the network, you're going to be seeing HTML files and scripts. Uh, and in emails, you're going to be seeing an email body and, and images and stuff like that. Now, I want to be clear, like these files aren't restricted to each of these buckets, right? If you download an executable from your email or a document, right, it's going to be going over all three because that's where email lives. Um, I just want to help brainstorm the differences here in that while these are all files, uh, they likely have their own unique structure of metadata and content that can help us uh, extract, aggregate, and then detect on, ultimately. Uh, so let's examine one of these files. We're going to be looking at Word documents. And what do Word documents typically contain? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bucket them into metadata and content. So with metadata, which is data about data, Right for Word documents, we're going to get things like the author, created date, last modified date, items you typically see by examining the uh, properties of a Word document uh, and, and content. So this is going to be the data itself. So for Word documents, you're looking at text, images, tables, colors, stuff you typically expect to see when opening the file. Uh, just for another example, uh, we're going to look at executables, right? So here we have metadata and content. So metadata is going to be stuff like your company name, file version, internal name. Um, then content's going to be imported libraries, uh, functions, uh, compile time, et cetera. And that brings us to this critical question right here. OK, why do we care about that? Uh, well, by understanding your environment, um, that is key to understanding how to gauge the health of it. So by understanding that, you can perform quicker incident response if, if needed. 
um, you're able to understand trends and commonalities in the data in your network. And most importantly for us, right, you're gonna be able to detect on this type of data. So metadata and content. So let's look to, like, uh, take a look at a, just one very high level example of how detection can work. Uh, in this example, we'll be looking at a, uh, an attempt to detect Word documents that run a macro when that document opens. So here we have the original document file. And in that file, we have a Visual Basic script. Let's also say that we have a, just a generic signature to detect strings auto exec or auto open. So we're just making a signature that says, if you see either of these strings, alert. That's it. You know, If our detection engine sees one of these strings, it's going to alert. So at its most basic level, Detection on files is typically defined as if this exists, then alert. You're all aware of how that works, right? And Derek walked you through examples with YAR already. And while that seems simple, uh, imagine the metadata and content we just looked at for Word documents, right? So we can, we can search on data ranging from authors to timestamps to the content itself and alert on the data we deem interesting or suspicious. Okay, so. That makes sense, but how can it be easily readable and ingested into a platform that you yourself can stand up? What is a potential solution for collecting and analyzing that file metadata and that content? And there's plenty of platforms out there, right? That will monitor your system and inform you of anything suspicious. Antivirus software, it, it does that, right? EDR solutions, et cetera. But today we wanted to go over a solution that can give you deeper insight into the files on your network, as well as uh, the ability to allow you to put your own YAR rules in or someone else's YAR rules in order to match on the files on your endpoints or traveling across your network. And that's gonna be called, as you guessed it, uh, Strelka. And Strelka is a passive open source platform that can receive analyze and then report on that metadata and content that we talked about for well over 50 file types. Um, it is a static analysis tool written in Python and Go that can ingest files like archives and executables and use scripts called scanners uh, that can extract any identifiable fields and values. Uh, for example, for like a, a Word document, right? We're gonna go with that. If, uh, if the author metadata is populated in that document, right, that data can be and will be extracted by Strelka for use somewhere else. Uh, Strelka also has a bunch of unique features. Uh, one example is that it supports uh, optical character, rec character recognition, so OCR, to scan images and extract any text in those images. Uh, another highlight I want to call out is that it's, it's modular. So if you had, let's say, a file type that Strelka doesn't support by default, doesn't have a signature for, you can write a small Python script and kind of just plug it right back into Strelka without having to modify any of the actual backend code and start up Strelka again. And it's going to start analyzing those files coming across the network or that you give it almost immediately. And finally, the reason kind of why we're here, Derek's been talking about, uh, it's Yara. So as I mentioned before, Strelka implements Yara for file identification, and also tagging. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. So at a high level, how does Strelka work? Now this, this process is a simplification, but it first starts with Strelka waiting for files to be submitted to it. Uh, as files come in, they're pushed to a front end for file staging and, staging and processing. Uh, in this front end component, the files are hashed and deduplicated. So as to prevent like repetitive analysis, just so the backend is not churning on the same file over and over again. Uh, and once that's done, the file is then sent to the backend component for the actual file analysis. So in this backend, this is where the uh, files are identified and analyzed by scripts called scanners. So it's at this point that if a Word document comes into Strelka, Strelka identifies that file as a Word document, and then runs the relevant document scanner to extract 
document-specific metadata like authors. And finally, uh, the analysis responses for it return to the user in a JSON format, providing them with the file results. So I've mentioned scanners already. Um, let's just take a quick look at them. Scanners are Python scripts that extract file data based on the file type. So as just a quick visual ex example, right? When the files are sent to Strelka, they're queued up for processing. Uh, Strelka then uses MIME types or Yara to identify what that file type is. And based on that, any scanners that match that Yara or MIME type are ran against that file. So in this example, we see that a document doc scanner and optical character emission or OCR scanner was selected to be run. By default, those scanners are, are set up to be run with Office documents. So file comes in, Yara, there's a Yara signature says, hey, this file looks like an Office document, therefore run an OCR scanner and a doc scanner. There's other scanners as well that, that are run like a compressed file scanner because Office documents are compressed files. Uh, but just for simplicity, these are the two that we're going to look at. Uh, so let's, let's just take a look at the doc scanner itself. Um, as I mentioned, scanners are small Python scripts that are run against the file for the purpose of extracting data. This is going to be a little tough to see, but on the left, we have an example of what part of a scanner looks like. Um, the data that's extracted, which you can see right here, is specific to that scanner. So you see here we have a title, keywords, uh, we have an author as well, all the things you might expect to see in a Word document. Uh, so just take note of the red box, and you might not be able to see this, uh, but this down here just says keywords equals, and then where you're getting the keyword. Um, it just shows, you know, with one line in a scanner, you may be able to co collect something critical in your detection, just changing one line. Now we are relying on third-party packages here, so open source packages uh, to do a lot of the processes, processing, but that's just to make it easier with the tried and true library, supported library. You can write your own if you want to. Okay, so let's take a look at a specific example of Strelka in action, just to give it some, some clarity on what exactly it's doing. Um, so in this scenario, we have a, an email that was part of a COVID-19 phishing campaign. Uh, this email included a Microsoft Excel attachment that when opened, prompts the user to execute malicious code. So upon receipt of this email, Strelka is sent several files, such as the email itself and any related attachments. So when, when Strelka gets that file, uh, it uses a Yara signature to identify what kind of file it sees. And then at this point, like Strelka will identify our file, well, it's gonna identify our files in Excel, Excel file, right? And then it's gonna run any related Strelka scanners. So these aren't noted as scanners, but we have like a JPEG scanner and then like a Visual Basics, a VB scanner, just because ex the Excel files, right? Or Strelk is saying, you have an Excel file, you're gonna run uh, an image scanner if you have an image in that Excel file or a, a script scanner if you have a script in that Excel file. And we'll, we'll play with that in a second. But for this scenario, right? Strelk identified the existence of an image Let's just imagine there was image in there. Um, and as there is an image, Strelka's OCR scanner is executed to read any text from the observed image. So you can just make out maybe in this image that the author wanted to have the user enable the editing mode um, in Excel, which is going to allow malicious code to execute. Once each scanner is then run, so the OCR scanner, for example, a JSON response is compiled and sent back to the file submitter or onto a data stream for analysis. And this is what the typical data structure looks like that's returned, right? So nothing complicated. Um, this is specific for the OCR response. So a file comes in, Excel, uh, the Excel file is identified, an image is found in that Excel file, the OCR scanner is run, and then we get our output text. And this happens constantly with other types of scanners, other types of output. 
Um, we'll go into some metrics at the end. But just to wrap up our introduction on what Strelka is before we get into Yara, um, I want to provide some other very high level examples of uh, what Strelka can help identify. The first could be suspicious startup files, right? So with Strelka, we get metadata as simple as the file names and file paths. And then these can be aggregated and searched on to act as like basic, very basic endpoint response tool. Um, in this example, right, we're, we're searching for any file name in the startup directory in Windows. That's not necessarily suspicious itself, right? But by aggregating file names on a known folder, we can identify outliers and then investigate further. So it's a really simple way to get started on understanding what's in your environment. Um, secondly, Strelka does pull out some network details from files. Uh, for example, it can pull out hyperlinks from any HTML files or, or text-based files it sees. Um, third, as, as we just covered, you know, it can perform OCR. So you see in this example, uh, we're looking for the existence of just three words inside of an image, not the text, that is alongside the image, but text inside the image. Um, you can get more specific than these three words, but we found that just these words is enough to frequently find specific types of phishing emails with a low amount of false positives, right? You go too narrow, you're, you're missing stuff. You go too broad, too many false positives. And finally, we can use Yara to tag or characterize files for use in a detection engine. So you see here, we have a, a Yara rule with the title Maldoc Suspicious Strings. Um, this example just shows that we had a file that matched that rule. And we'll go into more details with this in just a minute after a quick exercise. So we're gonna pause maybe for two, three minutes. Um, this isn't really an exercise more of just to run these commands and see what you see what you find out and we'll go over at the end um, but this is just going to we're going to have a go at submitting a file to strelka for the purpose of like observing how it works and what its output is so again two to three minutes uh, then we'll run through it together uh, just so i can explain what's going on what we're looking at and um, what's important there so And Paul, you did have one question in the chat, just wanted to bring your attention to. Cool, thank you. All right. Can I get alert notification through Strelka if something matches with a Yara rule? So uh, Strelka itself is not a detection and alerting system. Um, you will see in a moment that the output itself says, hey, I have a Yara match, but it will not alert it will not send an alert. It will not do anything. Redis will not help with that. You need a platform that essentially stands by and reads these files come, coming in and saying, uh, you essentially have a, a rule outside of this and say, if you see this Yara rule, I need you to alert somewhere. So you need a SIM or something very basic that can help read these files and say, hey, do something with this, right? Alert, store, something. But Shroka itself cannot do that. All right, so I'm actually going to I just realize where 10 minutes from. So I have a little bit more to go up over, but I want to just quickly jump in and um, I'm gonna screen share the results we have. Okay, so can everyone see my screen? Yep. Okay, cool. So I'm going to go back. We're going to go to exercise four. And I'm not going to go over what the file shock config or anything like that is. What all we're doing here is we're, we're using an application to send a file to Strelka. We have Strelka running in the back end. You don't have to worry about how that works or what it's doing right now. And all we're going to do is run that file shot command with a dash C, which says config, and then with fileshotconfig.yaml. And this is just pointing one of those samples files to the back end. Um, that can take a couple of seconds. It could take a minute. It's really how bogged down the system is. 
So if we look at the, um, the output file, you see it's, uh, it's uh, pr pretty busy, right? There's a lot going on there. That's all your metadata. Those are all your files that were scanned. And if we use JQ, which, sorry, I'm having trouble seeing. Okay. If we use JQ, you get a much easier way to digest that, right? Um, and all of these right here are scanners. So you see these top level keys, hash. That's a hash scanner. So that specific scanner, its only job is to get the hashes for that file. Header scanner, XML scanner. Um, and you can see what kind of scanners are run by doing jq.scan. Uh, that goes a little deeper. And then you can do leave. I think it might be file. No, scanners maybe. Well, let's jump back to the presentation. I have a couple examples in there. But I did want to jump to the next section. All right. OK. All good on the screen share? Yep. OK, cool. So um, yeah, this is what we saw, right? We have the giant blob of text. Um, I just highlighted one file. What's below this and what's above this is another file. And we'll go over what that means in a second. Uh, again, we're using JQ to make it a little bit easier to digest. Uh, you can expand that out by saying, you can chop off the root level objects. So dot file, so file is a, a top level object. Dot name is the object under that. Right, and this shows you the file names that were collected from that scan. We just gave it one Word document, okay? So a Word document came into Strelka, it did its thing, it, it unzipped a file because it's a compressed file. It ran OCR if there was an image, if there was an image in there. Um, and it pulled out all of these files. These are all, we have plenty of XML files, we have an image file in here. And it's gonna pump those right back into Strelka and then run any scanners against them. So this, this image file, it's gonna go right back into the pipeline and then say, oh, I have an image file. I'm gonna run an OCR scanner on it, right? So the Word document metadata will return to you, but it's also gonna say, I also found a image file in there. Here's some image file information. I found all of these XML files. Here's these XML information. So you get a lot of information tips sometimes just from one file in Strelka. And you'll see here an example of what I just talked about. Uh, each of these arrays is a different file, right? So I did this is what I was trying to do on the screen. Um, you see this top file, we ran a scanner called scan.docx. The next one we didn't because this scanner was not looking at a document file. It was looking at an XML file, one of the child files of that Word document. This makes a lot more sense with a little bit of time. Um, so I highly recommend going on GitHub there's a quick start for Strelka and throw a file or two in there and look at your output. And then you, also, you can also look at the Yara uh, files as well. And we're gonna take a quick look at Yara as well. Um, that output, again, JQ is not the best way to look at it. I would highly recommend you, if you're pulling, using Strelka, throw it in Elasticsearch or Kibana just to aggregate and visualize on the data. This is an example of, um, aggregating see we have a 16 count of a specific string just aggregating on on data just so it's a lot easier to search and visualize rather than just reviewing your terminal right so with the few minutes we have left uh, we're going to go into how Strelka works in conjunction with the Strelka platform and Strelka uses Yara in two ways the first being uh, file identification and classification and the second is detection tagging. So what do I mean by that, right? So identification in this context is Strelka using Yara to identify what kind of file it's looking at. Um, I mentioned earlier that Strelka also does MIME type classification, but we're not gonna focus on that. Um, and then Strelka can also use Yara for the purposes of detection tagging. And I mentioned that Strelka is not a detection platform itself. Uh, files are scanned by Strelka, matched against Yara rules, um, 
but then it has to be put into a sim or something to alert on those tags or metadata that it pulls out from those files. So using like an example, let's say a Word document comes into Strelka, and then there's a YAR rule that defines a pattern for a Word, what, what a Word document looks like, that's the identification of a file, right? And then a YAR rule says, hey, I also know, I, I know this is a Word document, so run a Word document scanner against that file, okay? That's, that's the identification classification. In addition, each file that also comes in is scanned with like a generic, like a generic YARA scan. That's gonna say, hey, this, I know this file is a document file, but I also noticed that this file matches a YAR rule for dry decks or phishing or whatever you put in there as a YAR rule. Um, so this sits alongside the identification of file type, but this, I don't have my pointer, sorry. But this is just the Yara tagging system, okay? So identification and tagging. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Um, so let's look at a, just a visual for both the identification and detection tagging pieces. So for file identification, um, we have a file coming into Strelka. Let's assume a JavaScript file gets pulled in. Second, we have something called a file taster. Uh, tasters help define what type of file Strelka is looking at. So this is going to be your, your, Yara, your uh, Yara itself, right? And then those tasters have, um, they have rules. So Yara rules called flavors that indicate what type of file Strelka is identified. So imagine taster is Yara, flavor is JavaScript, right? Because Yara is saying, oh, this file tastes like JavaScript. Weird way to put it, right? But it kind of works. Um, at this point, the flavor then decides what scanners to run, right? So in this example, if we had a JavaScript file, there's a JavaScript scanner that pulls out tokens and keywords. Um, and then there's also like a URL scanner that looks for URLs um, in there. So just, a, just an image-based representation of what we just talked about. So we have a JavaScript file um, for file submission. Next for identification, we have a a Yara rule, this is really hard to see, I know, but this is a JavaScript file, or sorry, a Yara rule that says, if this exists, we have a JavaScript file in there, right? And then recalling tasters and flavors, right? The taster in this example is Yara, um, and then the flavor itself is JavaScript. So the taster is Yara, this itself is the flavor saying, I know this tastes like JavaScript, a little tricky. Um, but once that's, once that's identified, um, it calls our JavaScript scanner, which you can kind of make out here. We have tokens, keywords, strings, and regexes. And then finally, we have our output. This is a sample of what uh, a JSON output for JavaScript scanner looks like, right? You see we have strings here, like we just messed with in the fourth, third, or second exercise. Uh, and then detection, right? So detection tagging. Detection is not entirely true, it's detection tagging. This is the, and this is the exact same process, but instead of using Yara for file identification, we're using it for just generic Yara pattern matching. Because with this specific example, we're not saying run this scanner or anything because it's just a file coming in. We're running a specific Yara scanner that says for every for every hundred or thousand YAR rules I have in here, run every single YAR rule against this file and tell me what it matches on. So a visual approach here, right? We have a, an Excel document, uh, the malicious Excel document. Uh, the file identification process occurs. Uh, Microsoft Excel documents identified by Yara. Um, that Excel document is, is ran against um, any relevant Excel scanners or, or DocX scanner, whatever we have but it's also reran against just a generic Yara scanner. Uh, this time it's not checking to see what kind of file it is, but to match against any of the Yara rules we have deployed. Uh, as you see here, we have a, a rule for office obfuscated strings. And then over here, our output, we have this in this JSON blob, right? We have a Yara hits or matches of our, our match here. So file came in and it's very passive, right? You just throw files in there, throw YAR rules in there, and it just tells you what matches. So how do we get about getting our rules into Strelka for scanning? Let's take a rule that Derek had mentioned, this Fin7 Carbonac rule, put that into Strelka. 
into this Yara folder, and that's it, right? <laughs> there's a there's a Yara folder, and all you have to do is drop any rule into the denoted folder, um, and within 15 minutes, that new Yara rule will be loaded, and it's going to start scanning against every file that comes in. Uh, Strelka is containerized, and it's going to rebuild every 15 minutes by default as a way of provi preventing memory leaks and performing cleanup. So I think we are actually out of time. Uh, I didn't have a whole lot more. I, I wouldn't sweat the time, Paul. I, I think you're okay. fine. We're yeah. good? OK. Uh, maybe we have about five, five or so more minutes, five to 10 more minutes. So we do have an exercise, a very brief one. I'm just going to go ahead and do this myself, if you guys don't mind. Uh, you, surely you guys can jump in as well. Um, but all we're going to do is we're going to make sure that we are going to share my screen again. We're going to go into exercise five. No, I'm not sharing the instructions anymore. I apologize. Um, and we have this sample in here. Okay, we're going to look at. We're going to take a look at the sample. This is just a sample yar rule. If you recall this string from earlier, Margarita Sexy that Derek had pointed out is interesting. We're going to go ahead and what we're going to do is we're going to copy this file into that Yara folder. We have a symbolic link in here. So you know, this, this will work fine. I'm just going to call it Paul.yara, whatever. Um, and that, just as an example, that is going to be like your Yara folder in, um, in Strelka. All you have to do is make sure that that Yara file gets inside of that Yara folder. And then the next time it reboots, which I'm doing right now, um, and it also reboots automatically, it's going to have those new, new rules in there. And then any files that come in from there on will have that rule attached to it. So Strelka is up again. I'm going to go ahead and run Strelka file shot, uh, file shot config. should take, again, anywhere from one second to maybe 30 seconds, depending on what it's working on. All right, so we're going to go to exercise5.log, and you'll see, again, we have that very nice looking output. So we want to make sure we use JQ to look at the scan and then not bad. Yeah. So what I did here is right. The top level is called scan. The top level key scan, and then the next level is Yara. That's Yara, the Yara scanner. So this is denoting that Yara scanner. And you see here we have output. You can also look at our matches, right? So this is one key in the Yara or in the Strelka output. It says matches. What Yara rules did this match against? Uh, we have a test file in there. It matches on everything. And then we have that rule I just put in there called sample exercise five margarita. If I did not put that file inside of that Yara share folder, this would not exist, right? Because we just we just made it. So it's it's really that easy. I really highly recommend you go. There is a quick start that's going to have a, a dummy Yara rule in there on the Strelka GitHub repo. Just give that a shot, play around with it. Um, it so might surprise you how neat this tool is. Um, I have just a slide or two left, kind of showing off some metrics. And share my screen. OK. All right, so Not going to cover a lot here. It is it is very fast. Um, we'll look at just very brief met metrics in a second. But what I want to cover here most importantly is it's passive, right? So imagine having thousands of YAR rules constantly looking at files on and crossing over your network. So I've used a couple detection platforms that do support Yara, but they typically only support targeting specific files or folders. So that's helpful in instant response for what you know you're looking for. But if you just have files going across your network and you want to dump all of your Yara rules in there and see what comes out the other side and then maybe have a sim alert on any of the interesting ones, this is perfect for it. Um, I don't know a lot of 
free systems that can do that. Uh, as for as for metrics, right? I wanted to give an example of how fast draw can be. So in our environment, uh, the one we have set up at Target, right? We have five and a half terabytes bytes, terabytes per day. The average file size being seventy kilobyte. Um, most of the scan time is pretty quick, so under a second. You see a couple that are over a second, right? But um, those are very large files, and in Incident response detection, right? Those large files are not what you're looking for. You're looking for the smaller ones. Um, and just as an example, we typically collect about, you know, four, 400 million files per day, so 32 million per hour or something like that. Uh, so it, it works, does not really hiccup. It, it, the limitation is kind of how much, um, how many resources you provide it. Um, and then it's, uh, it's open source, right? I mentioned open source, it's modular, key component as it allows the community to build a tool we can all benefit from. This was released in 2018. Um, we have a couple contributors outside of Target who use the platform and help out, contribute to bug fixes, file scanners, dependency updates, um, just all around great people helping out, makes the tool a lot better. Um, and if you wanna do that, that would be very much welcome. Uh, it's a powerful tool. I uh, highly recommend you find it on GitHub and give the quick start a shot. And as it's an open source project, right, we're also using other open source projects. Uh, for example, Lockheed Martin's Leica Boss is the foundation for Strelka. Um, and yeah, um, you can find it on GitHub. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, I don't know if we have any time for target or for questions, but you can find Strelka on Target's GitHub. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for, uh, thanks for Ferris for having us. Thanks for joining us, really appreciate it. We'll stick around if there's any questions. Um, yeah, sure. And again, these slides will be sent out. Um, so the links that you saw in some of the slides, uh, you'll, you'll be able to pull them from there as well. Thanks everyone.